very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a warm welcome to this last concert of the festival in Hagia Arena, which is one of the most astonishingly atmospheric concert venues I think I've ever been in in my life. It's been a huge privilege to do the series of talks to introduce us to extraordinary events. Now, tonight's concert is entitled The Mozart Miracle. And really, how could we think anything else of this best loved of musical geniuses? Tonight, we're going to hear two of his violin concertos and the Sinfonia Concertante for violin and viola, all of which are quite early works. The concertos written when Mozart was all of 19 and the Sinfonia Concertante just three years later. Yet they are no less miraculous for that, possibly even more so. Despite this, Mozart's relationship with the violin as a solo instrument was not an altogether happy one. And I thought it might be interesting tonight to have a look at the threads of connection that form a few key elements in his attitude to writing for this instrument. Namely, his relationships with his father, Leopold Mozart, with the instrument itself, and with his friend and later influence in chief, Joseph Haydn. First, a very short assessment of how we regard Mozart today and what the violin concertos contribute to that view, assuming that is, there is one. Mozart's music is in a funny way a little bit like tofu. It kind of soaks up the flavor that you add to it and these different flavors vary considerably really from era to era. For some, Mozart is boxed into a nice little early music pigeonhole. For others, he's the first romantic. And that view is starting to be mentioned a little more often these days. I think there's quite a lot to support this. It's interesting that Goethe's seminal, controversial and archetypally romantic novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther, was published when Mozart was 17 years old. And later on, the great poet dreamed of Mozart setting his Faust to music. He had to make do with Berlioz, of course, posthumously, which was somewhat different from what he would have chosen himself. But also, Mozart's determination to find independence rather than be tied to the sort of Kapellmeister posts in church or court that his father wanted him to take, this proud artistic self-awareness prefigured Beethoven's quest in a similar direction. Here, Mozart could well be seen as a sort of romantic era pioneer. I think there's also evidence for this view in the music we're going to hear tonight. For one thing, the violin concerto in A major number five has, if you think about it, a seriously radical beginning. It launches genially enough, but when the violin comes in, it seems to arrive from another world with music that has little to do with what precedes it. It's a sort of accompanied meditation that ponders the situation at some length with the diatonic melodies interrupted by some very chromatic moments before it sets off again along a more expected path. I'd just like to play you a little bit of what happens in it. So there we are, back to business. Mozart, of course, had particular strengths, just as anybody has. And among his greatest strengths was opera. He loved the human voice, 
fell in love repeatedly with singers, notably Aloysia Weber, the sister of Constanza, whom he later married. And his empathy for human predicaments of all kinds shines out from virtually every corner of his operas. The way he treats the violin in his concertos is virtually as substitute for the human voice. If you read Leopold Mozart's treatise on the fundamental principles of violin playing, you'll find that one of his prime instructions is that the violin should aspire to the sound of a singer. I think that that extract we just heard proves how closely Wolfgang Amadeus could obey his father's directive. If vocal writing was one of Mozart's strengths, another was the keyboard. It's rather telling that he composed 27 piano concertos, but only five for violin, plus a few standalone adagios and rondos. And despite the violin concerto's beauty and inventiveness and absolute apparent perfection, it's actually the piano concertos that went on to be the most interesting, sophisticated and significant of his concerto works. As I mentioned, the violin concertos are all early works. Numbers two to five were probably written in 1775. Over the years, he went on to compose more than 30 sonatas for piano and violin. But note the order of the instruments. Usually, especially in the early ones, the piano is the one that takes the lead. Essentially there for piano with violin accompaniment rather than the other way around. It's only later, in great works such as the B-flat sonata K454, which is a virtuoso masterpiece, an enormous fun to play, I have to say, um, that the instruments become truly equal partners. So what's really going on here? What does this tell us about Mozart? If you read his letters, you soon gather that he was absolutely at home at the keyboard adored the forte piano and won huge admiration for his skill at playing it. Yet around the violin, his words often seem suffused with frustration and discomfort. He played the instrument well enough during his child prodigy touring days. Once he played a minuet on the violin to a customs official at a border crossing as a small boy, winning the family a happy wave through. But as time went by, his interests became clearer Later, when he plays the violin, he often plays second violin, and when he plays quartets, he prefers the viola, while it is Haydn who leads their group as first violin. It seems, if you read not too far between the lines, that Mozart may associate the violin with matters he doesn't really like, notably control by others and submission to authority. Another issue, of course, is that if you play the violin, you are usually dependent on your co-musicians for the total effect. And if you're Mozart, they have got to be good enough. In a letter of October 1777, Wolfgang writes to his father from Augsburg, saying that he's just played a trio by Hafenender on the violin and would have liked to play more. But, quotes, was I was so badly accompanied that it gave me the colic, he said. Then he describes the local orchestra playing through one of his symphonies, during which he sat with the violins. But again, he says, the orchestra here is enough to drive you mad. And he takes exception to some sort of tasteless personal prank that they've played on him. Uh, orchestras don't seem to have changed very much in essence over the years. Um, present company obviously accepted. Though by all accounts Mozart was an excellent violinist, he seems happier and with more to say and more independently on the viola. And it's intriguing that aged about 22, he probably played his new Sinfonia Concertante for violin and viola with his father taking the higher instrument. And there's the real rub. His father was the family violinist. Arguably, the greater freedom that Mozart felt with the viola in his hand is represented by the almost violently emotional qualities of the Sinfonia Concertante's slow movement, which seems light years ahead of anything we find in the admittedly beautiful violin concertos. Again, this feels like Mozart as the first romantic 
He had experienced his own first big romantic disappointment by then. Aloysia Weber had turned him down. But somehow, even that doesn't feel like enough to explain the miracle of such intense sorrow that comes out of this music, something that truly points the way forward to the Romantic era. Sorry, dear violinists, but just listen to this and note the way that the violin tends to make a statement only to have the viola extend or subvert its thoughts. to that all night and luckily we are going to have the whole thing later. It's clear that by his early 20s Mozart had truly switched allegiance to the viola and when it wasn't the viola it was the piano. There's more than a little evidence for this in his letters. For example, in 1778 after Wolfgang had fallen out with the powers that employed him in Salzburg and was looking for jobs in Mannheim or Munich or Paris, Leopold was desperate to get him home to Salzburg again. He writes to Wolfgang, trying to persuade him to come back, which is the last thing he actually wanted to do. Um, among the enticements that Leopold offers is that, quotes, you wouldn't have to play the violin at court, but could conduct from the keyboard. Wolfgang replies, there's only one thing I would ask for in Salzburg, and that's not that I don't have to play the violin as I used to. I want to give up being a violinist. I'll conduct from the keyboard and accompany the arias. It would have been good, he adds, if I could have had a written assurance about the post of Kapellmeister, for otherwise I may have the honour of doing two jobs and being paid for only one. And in the end, he may again appoint some stranger over my head. Leopold somehow manages to take this very valid concern personally. The more you read of Leopold Mozart's letters, the more unreasonable this man seems. Having got his prodigy son off to a very dubious start of a career by parading him and his sister Nanel around the great courts of Europe like the proverbial performing monkeys, uh, he condemned the hapless Wolfgang to the backlash of jealousy and cynicism and resentment that inevitably followed in its wake. The same things happen very often to prodigies today. If you show too much, too widely, too soon, people immediately become cynical. 
The struggles that Wolfgang experienced in finding jobs later may have had much to do with this. Now, with Wolfgang in his 20s, Leopold is increasingly preoccupied with money, and he berates his son about finding a job and paying the family's way, though the terms he uses to do so can actually leave one's jawbone in pieces. Try this extract, also from 1778. Wolfgang has upset his father by dumping some pupils who fail to show up for their lessons. This is a last resort, likewise, for fed-up teachers today, and you can't blame them. Leopold, though, writes to tell him off for squandering a source of income, but in these terms. Just think whether you're not treating me more cruelly than our prince. He is ultimately a stranger to me, but you are my son. You know what I've put up with for more than five years, what a burden of care I've taken on because of you. The prince's behavior could only humiliate me, but you can annihilate me. He could only make me ill, but you can kill me. I mean, imagine your father guilt-tripping you to that extent. Mozart takes this kind of thing commendably in his stride, and he usually responds in reasonable, mollifying terms. You can almost feel him counting to ten before he puts the words onto the paper. But if Mozart somehow associated the violin with his father, and therefore his father's attempts to control him, it would be no great surprise. Enter another violin playing composer, 24 years Mozart's senior. He met Wolfgang probably at Christmas, 1783, when they performed in the same concert. His name was Joseph Haydn, and Mozart already knew and admired his brother, Michael Haydn. The pair were firm friends by the end of the following year. Though as Haydn lived at the Esterhazy court, which was out in the Hungarian countryside, he could only be in Vienna for a little while each winter. Mozart's love and respect for Haydn is clear, not least in his imitations of him. As ever, the sincerest form of flattery. These extend from references in the symphonies and piano concertos right up to the great operatic finales of, for instance, The Marriage of Figaro, which the Haydn specialist H.C. Robbins Landon has pointed out are actually modelled after Haydn's opera La Fedelta Premiata, which somehow isn't quite as famous as The Marriage of Figaro. A 1798 biography of Mozart by the bohemian musician Franz Xavier Niemicek notes that Mozart often called Haydn his teacher and adds that Mozart was often moved to tears by Haydn's music. But the most evident impact of Haydn's music on Mozart's appears in the six string quartets that are known to this day as Mozart's Haydn quartets. Mozart created them uncharacteristically slowly and carefully, often transforming the way he wrote deliberately in the light of Haydn's groundbreaking development in quartet writing whether this applied to the dazzling conversational exchanges between the instruments, the irregular lengths of phrases in minuets, or the presence of a folksy, whirling finale. For a heart-on-sleeve verbal tribute, look no further than the dedication by Mozart to Haydn. Mozart writes, To my dear friend Haydn, a father, having resolved to send his sons into the great world, finds it advisable to entrust them to the protection and guidance of a highly celebrated man, the more so since this man, by a stroke of luck, is his best friend. Here then, celebrated man and dearest friend, are my six sons. Truly, they are the fruit of a long and laborious effort, but the hope, strengthened by several of my friends, that this effort would, at least in some small measure, be rewarded, encourages and comforts me that one day these children may be a source of consolation to me. You yourself, dearest friend, during your last sojourn in this capital, expressed to me your satisfaction with these works. This, your approval, encourages me more than anything else, and I thus entrust them to your care and hope that they are not wholly unworthy of your favour. Do but receive them kindly and be their father, guide and friend. 
From this moment on, I cede to you all my rights over them. I pray you to be indulgent to their mistakes, which a father's partial eye may have overlooked. And despite this, to cloak them in the mantle of your generosity, which they value so highly. From the bottom of my heart, I am, dearest friend, your most sincere friend, W.A. Mozart. Haydn more than reciprocated this admiration. He wrote in one letter to an opera house head honcho, declining a commission for a new opera buffa. And he says, I should be risking a good deal, for scarcely any man can brook comparison with the great Mozart. Prague should hold him fast, but should reward him too, for without this, the history of great geniuses is sad indeed and gives but little encouragement to posterity to further exertions. And unfortunately, this is why so many promising intellects fall by the wayside. It enrages me to think that this incomparable Mozart is not yet engaged by some imperial or royal court. Forgive me if I lose my head, but I love the man so dearly. There is a more personal tribute still. When Mozart was living in the Domgasse in Vienna, he invited Haydn to meet Leopold, who was visiting from Salzburg. It was February 1785, and to celebrate Haydn joining the Freemasons, they played together through the last three of those string quartets. Leopold then wrote back to his daughter Nanel, Herr Haydn said to me, I tell you before God and as an honest man that your son is the greatest composer I know, either personally or by reputation. He has taste and moreover the greatest possible knowledge of the science of composition. It is tempting to think, and I feel not wholly implausible, that in Haydn, Mozart may be found an alternative father figure, and that Haydn, who was childless, found in Mozart a surrogate son. Haydn was referred to by many of his contemporaries, including Mozart, as Papa Haydn, perhaps because of his generous personality. But he really was a musical father, and not only for Mozart, but also for Beethoven, who was in fact his direct pupil and learned more from Haydn than he, Beethoven, really liked to admit later on. As for Mozart's violin writing in the so-called Haydn quartets, his view of the violin now has become quite exquisite, with Haydn himself implicitly playing the first violin part. The writing is collegial, intimate, friendly, conversational, eloquent and balanced. And I, I really feel that if I was to choose my Desert Island Discs pieces, one of those quartets, possibly the C Major Dissonance Quartet, would be first and last on that list. I do recommend going and listening to it. There's one special quality that Mozart and Haydn share that I'd just like to point out in the context of the pieces we're hearing tonight. It's a sense of humour. This transmutes into music in a way that some commentators might actually call divine play, a quality which Beethoven later made into a fine art in works such as the Diabelli Variations for piano. I feel it's a great pity that the sense of fun in Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven is very often these days squished in favour of a sort of po-faced reverence. I don't think we should be desperately reverential about the way we play these composers. Yes, they're sublime, but if we iron out all their wit, we lose a very vital dimension of the music. Mozart and Haydn shared their sense of fun with each other, their warmth, their expertise, their sheer passion for music and for life. They shared it with their close friends and they shared it with their audience, including us. It's interesting that in the Enlightenment, which was such an influence on Haydn in particular, the concept of humour was more important than we often credit it for. It was seen as a vital tool in order to reach and engage with the audience. Therefore, if we suffer a sense of humour failure while playing certain pieces by these composers, we're actually missing the point and letting them down. Our reverent attitude is not about their music, it's about us. Mozart's humour was there from the start, 
And though Haydn's famous wit later enhanced his own, we can still find it in his early works, especially the Sinfonia Concertante. I'd like to play you a little episode from the last movement in which Leopold and Wolfgang, aka violin and viola, perhaps take their sparring into the music and indeed may even find a way of resolving their differences and tensions there with humour. <coughs> The machine is playing up a little, but it'll be right there. out, because we really have to, in the grounds of Top Carpi Palace, that the A major violin concerto is of course known as the Turkish. Mozart was capitalizing on a vogue in Vienna at the time for all things Turkish, and why not? The dramatic central section of the last movement is supposed to sound in some ways exotic and savage and intriguing and supposedly Turkish. This dramatic rises and falls, it's strongly marked rhythms, the little grace notes that mark them. Most Turkish imitation music of that time involved a lot of percussion. Um, Mozart's Rondo a la Turca from his A minor piano sonata um, made use of some newfangled stops on the forte piano of the time, which you, you could pull a, a knob or press a knob and um, something would jangle and something would thump and you know, all sorts of exciting things would happen that you never get on a Steinway these days. Um, in the concerto, these effects are confined to the cellos and basses, but I will leave it to you to decide for yourselves how Turkish or otherwise this music really sounds when we hear it later. But I hope that tonight, one way or another, it will provide a slice of super sweet, top quality Turkish delight from the Grand Bazaar to delight us all. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for attending all these talks during this very special week, which I've loved. Thank you. Thank you.